think about leadership. you are in the dark <laughs> a lot of truth to that because <clears throat> and I'm not picking on speeders if you're a speeder then just bear with me but if we're driving down the highway 75 mile an hour and a 55 mile an hour speed zone and we see a police officer what do we do do we keep on driving 75 we slow down not in Michigan, not in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're doing 125 and a 30. <laughs> and so, but we slow down. Now here's the thing. If we're not careful, we're giving more respect to a man than we do to God. Because God sees it anyway. Now again, I'm not picking on speeders. It's the same with anything. Because if there are movies or television shows or whatever it is that we would watch, but we would never invite the preacher or the elders to come watch with us, the way I phrase it is we need to practice the presence of God. It comes down to that. Integrity is about practicing the presence of God, if you ask me. And so the person who walks with integrity is someone who is practicing the presence of God. In the dark, in the light, they're the same. Then he works righteousness. Righteousness is one of those words that's a very interesting word. <clears throat> we see it a lot in the Old Testament. We see it a lot in the New Testament. The book of Romans is all about righteousness. And so when we think about righteousness, uh, we probably tend to think most often about doing what's right in the sight of God. That makes sense, right? It is translated Israel was
And all these things will be added to you. Have you ever thought about why Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? What does He mean when He says His righteousness? I mean, back up in the text and think about the very Beatitudes that are listed. You know, all of my life I've heard people talk about, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they should be satisfied. And I've heard people talk about, man, we need to have a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. I'm starting to think that that's not what Jesus was talking about. And then you come down to verse 20 there in chapter 5, and He says, I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So what does that mean? And then, as I continue to read through the text, I come down into chapter 6, verse 1, and he says that we need to beware of practicing our righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them. And so I'm seeing this word righteousness over and over and over in the, in the terminology that Jesus is using in the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm beginning to think, okay, how does this fit? If Jesus was addressing this concept of God's justice and God's righteousness from the Old Testament, imagine how that would change what he was saying in regards to the Sermon on the Mount. Isn't it interesting the terminology that he used? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And isn't it interesting in the context of chapter 6 when he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men in order to be seen by them, that the very next thing he talks about is giving alms to the poor? Fasting, prayer. And then when you get to chapter 6, verse 33, and he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. It's in the context of don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink, or what you're going to clothe yourself with. God knows that you have need of all these things. I just wonder that if Jesus was talking about what might be connected to what we see in the Old Testament, is really the idea of righteousness for the Christian about Seeking God's justice and caring for the poor, the orphan, the widow, the stranger, and the alien in the land. <clears throat> I wished I had a better answer. But as I think about that concept, it sure makes a difference when I think about He not only walks with integrity, He works righteousness. And then He speaks truth in His heart. And certainly we understand the concept of truth and the idea of how that truth needs to be that which flows from the heart. The truth is something that is within us. It's that honesty that we have that is seen not only in what we say, but reflected in how we act. <clears throat> and you know what's interesting? As I've studied that verse over and over and over and over and thought about it in the, in the context of studying character and character, sculpting our character and character development, what I find interesting is that, <clears throat> that while those three words are significant, those are not the most important words in that verse. I found something that I thought was so extremely interesting. Look at the words works, walks, works, and speaks. In the original language, those are called noun verb participles. What that means is, is they function as both a noun and a verb at the same time. So what David is describing in this psalm when he talks about integrity and righteousness and, and truth is that it's not just what we do, it's who we are. It defines who we are, noun. But it also describes what we do in the active sense as a verb. So the idea of integrity and righteousness and truth all flow out of a person's being. It's who we are. It's not just a coat we put on on Sunday and that we walk into the building and now we become super Christian. That's not the way it works. One of my favorite things to learn about people is when I visit them in the home 
And they are no different in their home than they are in the church building. They're the same. That's who we need to be. We don't need to be different when we're on the job. We're still a Christian. We don't need to be different when we're in our homes. Our wives and our children need to see consistency in the way that we are, whether we're at home or whether we're in the church building. Because here's the thing. Why would we give the best of our life to people that we don't live with? Now, I love you. Don't get me wrong. But my wife and my kids deserve my best because they put up with me. <laughs> they need my best. And if we can convince leadership in the home <clears throat> to develop the kind of character that as a father, as a, a, a husband, as a leader in the home, that our wives and our children and our grandchildren are going to see the same person. That they know that this is who we are. Not just something we do on Sunday. Character. When I think about character, there's so much. And I was telling <coughs> Carrie earlier, this is one of my... It, it is, without a doubt, my favorite section in the seminar. And mainly because I'm preaching to me. This section is really about helping me to become... <coughs> what I tell you that you need to be. And that you need to see the same person whether I'm here or whether you visit me in Louisiana. And there is so much about character development that is so important. It's not just words. It's more than words. John Maxwell is so big on this idea that character is not just something that we do or not just something that we say. But it's who we are and what we do. Yes? Can you handle the difficulty, uh, just as an example, uh, being a plumber? He works all day fixing other people's drains, other people's plumbing. When he comes home, he's too tired to fix his own. <laughs> Mechanics have the worst cars. That's what I've always heard. <laughs> so, you know, you're talking about character here and, and how it's revealed to our family. Very good. Good analogy. Uh, we need to be careful. Yeah. That we save some for our families, essentially. Yeah, you're exactly right. <clears throat> because that's what's going to make the difference in how they see leadership in the church, how they view the church. I mean, it begins in the home. It's good to look at the contrast between chapter 14 and chapter 15. Chapter 14, you have no character. And chapter 15, you have the character that will please God. Very good. To make that contrast. Yes. To, to read the one without the other is to... Miss it a little bit. Yeah. Put them together and it's, more, it's very powerful. Very good. Very good. And when we think about how David then takes that to this level, as, as I mentioned, Maxwell talks about that it's more than just words. Then he makes this statement, which I think is so significant, and that is talent is a gift, but character is a choice. <clears throat> Everybody in this room has some level of talent, some more than others. It's a gift. And our gifts all vary, but they're all needed. Can you imagine if everybody in the church was a song leader and nobody could preach? Oops. Yeah, whoops. That's right. Imagine if everybody in the church, all they could do was preach. Nobody would lead prayer. Nobody would lead singing. You see, God designed the church. And let me tell you right up front, you need to be thankful that there are women who can cook. Because if you had to eat my cooking, you'd be in trouble. And so, God gave talent to people. But character is a choice. We choose to become a godly man. A Christian. So let's make the right choice. Because character determines the level of success that we achieve. It determines our success. You think about character. Who will people follow? They're going to follow someone that they see as having the kind of character that God wants them to have. And so that's why this section is so challenging to me. <clears throat> there is much, and I'm going to go through here very quickly, and you have some of this, uh, if not most of it, on your sheet. 
But how do we improve our character? I, I want to talk a little bit about some books that I've read here recently. Obviously, I think the main book that we need to use is God's Word. But obviously, there are people who have written some different things that it's amazing to me that if you were to add Scripture to what they were saying, it comes from Scripture, even though they may not be the most godly. But the way that they phrase it sometimes really is helpful, at least to me. There is a book written by a woman named Susie Welch entitled The 10-10-10 Principle. Has anybody ever heard of it? Well, <clears throat> you're going to be surprised how it works because it kind of like it is. <laughs> but the idea of the 10-10-10 Principle is that when it comes to making a decision in our life, we need to ask ourselves, can I live with this decision in 10 minutes? Can I live with this decision in 10 months? And can I live with it in 10 years? Now, as, as she describes in the book, it was funny, I understood the principle from just reading the back cover and, and kind of perusing the, the table of contents. And so I never read the book for the longest time, but I always talked about this principle because I had such a, a vivid illustration. I had a young couple that came to me. Actually, the wife came first and she said, I need your help. I mean, we're headed towards divorce. And so I said, plan to meet and said, so bring your husband. So we all met. And I listened. And so <clears throat> she left the room. And I just asked him. I mean, I'd just gotten this book. I hadn't even read it yet. But I knew the principle. I said, I want to ask you. There was no infidelity. They just couldn't get along. I said, can you live with this decision in 10 minutes? Can you live with it in 10 months? I said, can you live with it in 10 years? I said, I think I know you well enough to know you're mad. You're really mad. And you'd have no problem saying in 10 minutes, I got no problem living with this decision. I said, and you're probably mad enough that you could live with it for about 10 months. I said, but can you live with it 10 years from now? And he just broke down and wept. He said, you're right. I am mad. And I can live with it in 10 minutes and probably 10 months. He said, but I don't want to be alone the rest of my life. I said, then what do we need to do to fix it? And I mean, it was bizarre, his request. <laughs> but it was like, <clears throat> once he got it out on the table, we were able to work through it. Not only did it save their marriage, but they're faithful now to the Lord. I mean, it's powerful to think how one question... <laughs> is so significant in our lives to think about it. So then I read the book. <laughs> and the book. <laughs> once I read the book, it was like, oh, this makes a whole lot more sense now. <laughs> so once I read the book, here's the idea. And the 10, 10, 10 principle starts with the question. And so the idea is that we're trying to figure out what is the issue. We're thinking about making a decision, but what is the issue that's leading to this decision that we need to make. I mean, is it a problem on the job? Is it a problem in the marriage? I mean, and what is that? What is the issue? Is there infidelity involved? You can't get along? I mean, if, if we don't start with the question and ask what is going on and try to determine what the issue is, then it becomes very difficult then to find a way to get an answer and, and to come to some resolution. The second part is data collection. So now we're trying to gather as much information that we can. Whoops, back up. I'm revealing too much. Of course, you have it written down anyway. So we're trying to collect information. And let me tell you, there are two sides to every story. Don't just listen to one side. If we gather only information from one party or one situation, we may make a wrong decision. I can't even tell you how many times that has bitten me. I mean... <clears throat> As a father-in-law, when your child comes to you and they start saying, my wife is doing this. Don't, I don't want to hear it. Work it out. But see, when they tell me what their wife or my daughter tells me what her husband's doing, it's like you're tainting. You're tainting. You're biasing my view of your mate. I said, unless you want me to talk to them, and find out <laughs> their side of the story, you need to work it out. But see, we've got to gather the information. And so we've got to find out from everybody involved 
what's going on. Gather as much information as you can and then analyze it. We spend little time analyzing. We're so quick that when we're hearing stuff, our minds are already working. We're trying to solve the situation in our minds as people are speaking and we often miss things because we're not listening well. So we need to analyze the data that we've collected. So we're gathering all this stuff and we're trying to figure out, okay, it's really not about 10 minutes, 10 months, and 10 years. It's really about, can I live with this in the short term? Can I live with it in kind of the mid-range? And can I live with it long term? So it's not literally about 10, months, 10, week, 10 minutes, 10 months, and 10 years. It's really about evaluating, can we, once we make this decision, <clears throat> for you guys who work in corporate leadership, somebody brings you information about an employee and you're determining whether you're going to fire them or not. Well, do you make that decision before you've collected information from that individual or gathered the information to know whether everything is accurate and maybe to try to find out what the issue was that caused the situation? You see, you have to do all of that. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to character development. Sometimes, in a moment, we're faced with making a decision that's going to influence the way people see our character. And it would do us well that before we decide, and I'm not talking about just immoral action, but certainly would include that. But our practice ethically, in that moment, we're about to make a decision or to say something, if we could just pause long enough to think, okay, how is what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do affect the people around me? And can I live with that? Now, a few years from now, and long term. And how does that influence the cause of Christ in the life of others? Now, from there, <clears throat> I'll compare data with values. When I think about this 10-10-10 principle, there's what I call a character audit. And the way that I, I describe this is that when we think about the character audit, it, what it amounts to is, is we're thinking about our core values. What are our core values in life? Our core values, whether it be hard work, integrity, ethics, whatever they are, the character audit involves sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly. But the idea is just to look back, if we can, over the past 30 days. And we think about our character and what we've done in our life and the things that we've said. Has our life over the last 30 days been consistent with our core values? If not, then we need to not ignore it. We need to not try to deny it or sweep it under the rug. What we need to do is face up to it and fix it. Because the way we're going to improve our character is recognizing, in light of our core values, how we live our life. We're evaluating our life. It goes back to that formative evaluation ring. We're constantly evaluating home, world, and church. And the consistency with which that takes place. It's all about character. And so, we're not going to do this because of time. But one of the things that I like to do is ask people to sit down and do that. To actually sit down and write out. And I would urge you to do so at home. To take time and write out what your core values are. Because only you know them. And then to ask yourself, in 30 days of my life, are there areas where there are inconsistencies? And if there are, then fix them. That's why this is so important. Because if we can improve, if we can develop a plan that will help us improve our character, think about the difference that's going to have when it comes to our influence for the cause of Christ. 10-10-10 principle. Boy, it's a great book. I really urge you to get it if you can. <clears throat> I want to say it's been six years ago now that I was introduced to this book, Leadership and Self-Deception. When I read this book for the first time, I cried, I laughed, and then I repented. I had some things I had to fix. If I were going to recommend a secular book out of all the books that I've ever read, if I was going to recommend a book 
that every individual in the Lord's church should read, apart from the Bible, it'd be this one. It's written by the Arbinger Institute. It's not what you think it is. It's not like any book I've ever read before. It's a narrative. It's just a story. It's about this guy that goes into work one day and he, he's being called into his boss's office. He thinks he's going in to get a promotion. And what he goes in to find out is quite the opposite. And it's just the way this story reads. I mean, it just sucks you into it and you start seeing yourself in the position of that guy. It is the best book on relationship development that I know of. Leadership and self-deception. Here's how it works. <clears throat> I have a decision I need to make. The way he describes it is <clears throat> he's laying there in the bed with his wife and the baby starts crying. So he has this sense that says, I should get up and take care of the baby. But he betrays that sense and he continues to lay there. And while he's laying there, he starts picking his wife apart. I work hard all day, every day. She stays here at home. Why doesn't she get up and take care of that baby? Is she just pretending to be asleep? And I mean, he just rips her apart. And what he describes in that book is that when we have this sense of something we should do, and we betray that sense and make a different decision, we get in a box. It's called the box of self-deception because we've betrayed our sense of what should have been done. And when we're in that box, we start building a case as to why everybody else is against us. I mean, was his wife this horrible person who's faking being asleep, who's not aware of how hard he works before the baby cried? No. She was a loving creature who was by his side, supported him in his work. But once we get in that box, then everything changes. It changes the way we feel. It changes the way we see ourselves, And changes the way we see others. And it changes the way we see the world. Because what happens is we begin to elevate in that box, our own goodness. Because we're the most stellar human being that ever walked on the earth at that moment. And we de-evaluate or we devalue everybody else's qualities. And so in that moment, we start showing how, in our minds, we start thinking everybody else, we see them differently. And it's called self-deception. It's a powerful book. I kid you not. It is a powerful book. Well, <clears throat> they have three in the series. And the three books in the series are Leadership and Self-Deception. The second one is The Anatomy of Peace. In The Anatomy of Peace, it goes back to the story, but now it goes back to the founder of the company, whose name is Lou. And Lou describes how he, div he came to understand this concept that he describes in the first book. But in the second book, he goes on to describe four types of boxes that we can get in. And you have them listed out there on your sheet. Because the four types of boxes that we get in are the better than box, the I deserve box, to be seen as box, and the idea of less than box. Now, I'm going to describe those in just a moment. But the third book in this series is, I just really read it here recently, called The Outward Mindset. And the whole principle upon which all of this is based is really developing an understanding that before we make decisions, when we think about what we say and what we do, we're, we're first of all considering what's in the best interest for the people who are going to be affected by my choice. The middle book... I probably wouldn't recommend. It was a gift to me, and I probably wouldn't have read it because Lou was a Marine, and his language as a Marine was very worldly. And so there's some bad language in the book. And so I don't recommend that book. But the first one, 
I recommend. And the last one, I recommend. Because they align the most with some of the biblical principles. But I have read all three of them, and I want to share with you the way this thing works. Self-betrayal. When we betray ourselves, people are then seen as objects. They're not people, they're not souls, they're an object. And so everything about them is less than who we are. And so that's the challenge that happens. And the way this is described is what they call the choice diagram. There is this sense or this desire. And once we have that sense to help someone in an area of need, we have to decide whether we're going to honor that choice, honor that sense, or we betray it. When we betray that sense, we have feelings that generally fall in the category of anger, depression. We get bitter or we try to justify ourselves. And then the view of myself is, is I become better than somebody else. I become the victim. In other words, they owe me. I'm the idea of viewing myself as being bad. I was made to be this way. It was their fault. Or I want to be seen well. So I've made this choice because of how I think other people will now see me. And then we view others as having no rights. They're here to serve me. It robs me of peace. They're a threat to me. And we become very bigoted. And then our view of the world is it's unfair. It's unjust. It's a burden to me. And it's against me. And so once we get in this box, it begins to shape our character and who we are. And so, as I mentioned, there are four types of boxes. There's the better than box, the I deserve box, the must be seen as box, and the worse than box, or less than. And here's the way they work. The better than box is one where my feelings become impatient, disdainful. They're indifferent. And so, this is the way I feel because I'm better than everybody else. And so once I begin to feel this way, I feel better than everybody else. I get impatient with them. They're not working up to my standard. It's better that I do this than somebody else do it because I can do it better. And so that's the way we begin to feel. And we're very indifferent towards others. And the way I view myself is I'm superior. I mean, after all, I am the best. And so we're important. We're virtuous. We're the one that's right. And then we begin to view others as inferior. They're incapable, they're irrelevant, and they're false. They're wrong. And then we begin to see the world as competitive. It's very troublesome to me because the world needs me and all these people are out here trying to get my job. They're trying to take my, my livelihood away from me. And that's when we get in that box. The second box is the I deserve box. This is where we begin to feel entitled, deprived, and resentful. There are a lot of people in this box. A lot of people in this box. We are living in a generation that's really in this box in a lot of ways. And the way we begin to feel about or view ourselves is meritorious. I've earned this. That's why I'm entitled to get it. I'm the one who's being mistreated. I'm the victim here. And I'm unappreciated. Do people not know my talent? I mean, my goodness. The world owes me. I know I'm only 18. But hey, the world owes me. And then we begin to see others as mistaken. They're mistreating me. And they're ungrateful for the skills that I bring to the table. And then our view of the world is unfair, unjust, and it owes me. And then the must-be-seen-as box. This one's really interesting. Because when we need to be seen a certain way, we become very anxious. We get afraid. We're needy. We're stressed all the time. I'm trying to get this done. I'm just overwhelmed. I've got more to do. I had a guy tell me one time, I've got 420 things on my to-do list. I'm never going to get it all done. I'm like, well, you got a problem. I'd say you're overwhelmed. <laughs> but that's the way we begin to feel when we get in this box that I need to be seen as busy. I heard a guy in the mission field, I mean, on the phone, talking to supporters. How are things going? Man, I am just busy all the time. And I'm like, no, you're not. But he needed to be seen that way. And then the way we see ourselves is we view ourselves as needing to be in a position to where we're seen as well and beneficial. Uh, we're well thought of. And it really becomes fake is what happens. We view others as being judgmental. They're threatening. And we see them as our audience because they're judging what we're doing. We need to be seen in front of them in a certain way. And then we view the world as dangerous. They're watching and they're judging me. Now the last box <clears throat> also happens almost what I consider to be a false sense of humility. 
and that is the worse than box. We feel helpless, we're jealous of other people, we're bitter, and we get really depressed. We're below the line, <laughs> if you will. We view ourselves as not as good as other people. Oh, I appreciate that, but I'm not, oh no. You know, this guy, he's far better than me. I don't even deserve to say, such shine as you. We feel broken and deficient, and we feel faded. And then the idea of the way we view others is they're advantaged. Well, they grew up with a silver spoon. I mean, why wouldn't they be good? I mean, they've give, been given every privilege. They're blessed. And then we view the world as hard and difficult. It's against me and it ignores me. Now, here's the thing that's interesting about these four boxes. We can be in any one of them at any time during the day, and we can experience all four of them at the same time or in the same day. We can go in and out of boxes just depending on the circumstance. I mean, in one moment we can be in the worst than box, and the next moment we're in the I deserve box. And it depends on the people that we're around, and it depends on, oftentimes, this is what's really the saddest part, is we make a decision of what box we're in based upon how other people treat us. And so when we think about character and character development, if we can become aware of these situations in our life, then we can begin to make a decision that's going to prevent us from getting in those boxes. And that's what the first book, book is all about. The Leadership and Self-Deception book is really about how do we recognize when we're in the box, how do we get out of the box, and how do we stay out of the box, which is why the last book is so important. The last book, The Outward Mindset, is really the most biblically based book for not using biblical passage that I know because it's always about others. It's thinking about where they are, why they are in the situation they're in, and how can we help them. We begin to think about why would Fred act this way? Is there something going on in his life that I need to be aware of before I make a decision to fire him? Shouldn't I find out that you know, he's got problems at home. Maybe I can help him. Make a different decision that will help him. So it's just the whole concept. When we think about the church and the application within the church, wouldn't it be different that when somebody, when we walk in and we say, how are you doing today, Mrs. Smith? Fine. <laughs> Is that her normal character? Well, for some, maybe. But wouldn't it be good to know why she responded the way she did? I mean, shouldn't we try to find out before we start saying, well, that crabby old woman? See, we're, we're in a box. The minute we think it, we're in the box. Because we're not others first mentality. So character development is significant. It's essential to our leadership. And that means we need to start thinking about others and why they are doing what they do and how we might help them. Because if we can help them, we stay out of the box. Because we're always thinking others first. And that's really what this is all about. And it comes down to this one word. It's about trust. It's about trust. I want to tell you a story that happened. And I, I tell you, it was the most bizarre thing. I never <coughs> anticipated this when I went, <clears throat> but it was so powerful. And it has helped shape what I'm about to share with you in these next few minutes. My wife and I, when we lived in Greenbrier, Arkansas, and I was the preacher there, every year for about three or four years, I was invited to lead the prayer at the Chamber of Commerce banquet. The Chamber of Commerce president was a member of the church, and he said, I'm going to have a member of the church lead in prayer if I'm in charge. And I said, okay. So I got to go to several banquets, as long as he was in charge. It may have been four years. But every year they would invite in somebody as a guest speaker. And this particular year, one year they had the governor that came, Mike Huckabee at the time, and one year, which is, was the most significant for me, was they invited in Houston Nutt of all people. <laughs> At the time, he was the head football coach for the Arkansas Razorbacks. And <clears throat> when he got up to speak, I was just kind of really nonchalantly just listening. And then he began to talk about something that I kind of keyed in on. 
because he got to talking about when, when they recruit football players to come into the Razorback football program, he and his staff sat down with every single incoming freshman. And they emphasized to those incoming freshmen the privilege it was for them to be a Razorback. That there was nothing more important and nothing more significant than for them to be a part of the Razorback football program at the U of A. And he said, then we asked them three questions. And I thought, okay. The first question he asked them was, is, can I trust you? Can I trust you to go to class? Can I trust you to do the work that your teachers assign you? Can I trust you? And then the second question he asked them was, are you committed? Are you committed to being an Arkansas Razorback? Are you committed to giving 100% of your effort both on and off the field? Are you committed to this program? When he got to the third, I'm writing down as fast as I can because I'm thinking at some point in life this is going to be important. The third question was, do you care? In that moment, I thought, if you take a group of people that you can trust, who are committed to the cause, and who care, you'll change the world. You will change the world with a group of people that you can trust, who are committed, and who care. And that's the type of character that we need to have as leaders. That we're the type of people that are trustworthy. I want to focus just on that first question. Can I trust you? But I want you to think of it just a little bit differently. I guess all my life, I have heard sermons that emphasize the need for us to trust God. I'll never forget the first time I ever preached for a congregation larger than about 100. <laughs> we were in Colorado and I, was, I hadn't even started preaching school yet. This was 1990. We went to Colorado. My dad and mom lived there. And so we went there. I was going to start preaching. That's the reason I chose Bear Valley over Sunset. Sorry. <laughs> mom and dad lived in Colorado and I was going to live close to them. So we moved out there and dad asked me to preach one Sunday night. And I'm sitting there on the front row and I guess he could see that I was a little bit nervous. <coughs> and so he leaned over and he said, Son, are you nervous? In my mind I thought, Yep! <laughs> <coughs> yeah, you could say that. <coughs> so he opened his Bible to Proverbs 3 and he said, Read verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. And I have heard that. I've memorized it. I've quoted it. I know beyond any doubt that we need to trust our God completely, wholeheartedly. And that is hard to do. That's not the question. The question is, can God trust you and me? Now think about that. When we think about our relationship with God, it's about, can God trust us? You know, when Paul wrote to church in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says that we're stewards of the mysteries of God, and it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Can you imagine can God trust us? Can He trust us to be good students of His Word? I'm not talking about, can He trust us to read it? It should frighten us to some degree to think about James chapter 3, verse 1. Be not many of you teachers, knowing that you shall incur a stricter judgment. First verse I ever remember that I remember memorizing as a child was 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study, King James Version says, 
New American Standard says, Be diligent to show yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling accurately the word of truth. Can God trust us to be good students of His Word? You know, and whether we're teaching a class or preaching a sermon, we need to realize that our purpose in that moment, whether it's 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever it is, our purpose in teaching that material is to change people's lives. We're not just trying to fill a, a moment in time with information. We're trying to change their lives. That should drive us to be better students of His Word. Can He trust us to evangelize the lost? Shall I plug it one more time? <laughs> Bring, teach, keep. Can He trust us to evangelize the lost? It baffles me sometimes to even think about the number. Seven plus billion people Seven billion people. I think between Dallas and Detroit, half of them were in the airport. <laughs> Seven billion people. And the World Census Bureau says every second, 1.8 people die. In the time it takes to hear a 30-minute sermon or to watch the evening news or to watch a half-hour sitcom, 3,460 people will stand before God. Most, if not all, are not ready. I don't know how to impress upon us the urgency of the situation. Can God trust us to evangelize the lost? You know, that's really what He taught us to do. <laughs> Go, make disciples. Go, preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't have any other plan. That was the plan. Evangelize the lost. Take the light of the gospel into a world of darkness. It hurts me. I don't know about you, but it hurts me. Can God trust us to evangelize the lost? Can He trust us to love the church? To love His church? This is really becoming more real for me as I think about the effort to try to merge these two congregations. And it's not on me. I mean, I'm just a small part of the equation because it's going to take those men coming together to do this and God and His Spirit to move in this, <coughs> excuse me, in this situation. But when I think about the church, we've been too much about dividing instead of about uniting. And to bring about what God intended for His people. He prayed that we would be one. Jesus prayed that we would be one as He was one with the Father. And I think we've taken the idea of autonomy to a level that I don't think God intended. Amen. I think God intended us to work together. We need to help one another. And I'll tell you, this was the statement that was made in that first meeting that we had with the congregation across town. The guy that opened up the meeting said this, We know that you don't need us. He said, you guys got a good thing going. He said, you don't need us. He said, but we need you. We need you. And I thought, you know, if we could all have that mentality, there wouldn't be this divisive spirit. There wouldn't be this spirit of staying separate. There would be this spirit of we need to work together and we need to find a way that we can help one another achieve what God intended for His kingdom. And when I look at John 13 and I think about Jesus when He said, a new commandment I give to you, 
that you have love for one another as I have loved you. You want to know the number one reason that has caused division in the church? It's called me. I need to get my way. I want what I want. That's what causes division in the church. Call it pride, call it whatever. But it all comes down to me. That middle letter in the word sin, I. And I can't help but think that's Jesus was not talking about that. And this whole concept of developing trust doesn't exist. I have a hard time trusting somebody if I think that the only thing that's going on in their life is about them. They're pointing everything to themselves. It's like, I'm not sure I trust you. Because when they talk about everybody else, you know, let me tell you one of the things I love about the church at Waterford? I've not even worshipped here yet. You want me to tell you what I love about this church? Is everything that that man right back there has told me. How could you not love the church? Daniel's same way, <laughs> riding with him from the airport. I'm telling you, it's awesome to see. And that's the way it should be. We should have those kind of conversations about the love that is expressed among brethren. That's what was the drawing force of people outside of the church in the first century. People wanted to be involved in that. And it really wasn't at first about the message. They wanted what they had. And it was unity. And it was love. So when we think about this idea of our relationship with God. Can He trust us to love His church? <clears throat> Can He trust us to make the right choices when it comes to leadership? You know, there are a lot of schools in the brotherhood that train preachers. They're good. They're all good. At least the ones I know are good. But I've never heard of or seen any type of training for elders. For leadership. And in my, maybe I'm wrong, but in my thinking, we need to do something. The church needs to stand up and do something somewhere. Somebody needs to stand up and say, we need to develop something that's going to help the church. I would love to see the church at Waterford or somewhere be willing to say, let's do something. Let's put together something. It's going to help the church develop leaders. Can we make the right decision? Can God trust us to make the right decision? What are we doing to plan for a succession? Who's going to replace the elders that are here? Any thought? Have there been any plans made for who's going to fill those shoes? Now, I'm, again, I may be totally wrong. My experience, this is how elders have been selected. You know, Brother Joe, his kids are all Christians. He's a pretty good businessman. And he's taught class. He's a pretty good fellow. Why don't we put him in? He'd be a good elder. And that's the way it's done. Now, I'm not saying it's done that way everywhere. But that's the way I've seen it done. But I've never seen yet a succession plan in the church where men were being groomed and prepared that when the elders either got to a point to where they had to step down or they died, that there was somebody to step right in and fill their shoes. And I think that's why we're facing a leadership crisis. I think that's why we're dealing with the circumstances that we face where 60 to 70% of the Lord's church in this country doesn't have elders at all. And the churches that do have too few who are serving. We need to think about how we can improve what's going on. And not only when we think about character development and this idea of trust as a part of that character in relationship to God, but it's also about our relationship to God's people. And I really just have one statement that I want to make in connection to this, and it's being connected to God's people. If leadership can be trusted, it's going to be because they are connected to God's people. 
Let me give you an example. <coughs> Excuse me. First time I read this, I believe in John Maxwell's book, 21 Irrefutable Laws, but I don't know if it was that one or 21 Indispensable Qualities. But he was talking about the law of connectivity. And he, and he put in his book, uh, I think it came out of USA Today, but it was uh, on Boss's Day, a letter that was written by the employees of Southwest Airlines. And it was to Herb Kelleher, who was the CEO of Southwest Airlines. In the letter it said, thank you, Herb, for singing at our Christmas party. And thank you for only singing once a year. <laughs> and then it was, thank you for driving your Harley Davidson into corporate headquarters. And thank you for playing golf with only one club. And thank you for showing up on Thanksgiving and Christmas to load baggage with us. I mean, it was just one thing after another. And then, oh, excuse me, I can't even, it's hard to swallow. It said, thank you from every one of your 16,000 employees. Now that was, I think, 1994. Do you think he was connected to his people? How connected are we to the church? Are we connected to the people that we are working among, shepherding, leading, teaching? Do we know what their needs are? Or are we assuming? Are we con 